Amy, I, I'm from North Philly, Hunting Park to be exact. I've been in a few fights, and I was even in a fight last night most recently, uh, but th this fight, I was fighting whether or not to have a second or third oatmeal cream pie. So that, that doesn't quite fit the mold is like the first kind of pork boss. The only thing <laughs> that you fight is indigestion, okay? <laughs> Cooler than a polar bear's toenails. It is the Sixers Talk podcast brought to you by Wilmington University. Wilm U Works, Danny Pommels, Ben Barry in the cut, Mr. Producer Extraordinaire. Noah Levick will not make it today, but we have one of my favorite co workers, if not the favorite, mm -hmm. uh, someone I used to work with for a long time. We don't get to work together, together as much anymore. Um, Jill of all trades, uh, but you know her mostly as Sixers pre and post game host amy fadul we appreciate you joining the podcast welcome get comfortable thank you for being here literally i thought when you said like you used to work with me i was like do you have some news for me danny am i but we used to do shows together every night we used to do shows together every night six o'clock and a 10 o'clock and sometimes yeah. you know, the power rises on game day exactly exactly it's a good, time. It's a good time still good times i still get to see you in the office but you're like over in nbc 10 land most of the day and, and we are usually talking more about our kids and our personal mm -hmm. lives and things like that. But today we get to talk shop. And uh, the Sixers, man, the, the cupboard is getting full, Amy. Another guy coming in, uh, a really live body. Um, really one of the most prolific bench scorers, along with Jordan Clarkson, over the last several seasons we've seen in the NBA. Montrez Harrell is on board in a two-year deal, a player option in the second year. And Amy, I mean, another Maury, uh, Doc Rivers type mm -hmm. of disciple in, in the fold. Uh, how surprised were you finding out about him coming on board? Because I, it, it surprised me. I thought they yeah. were almost done. I thought yeah. that, you know, making big acquisitions was over yeah. with. You were thinking like maybe like a bench piece that you weren't as familiar with that you would have to like Google some kind of like stats <laughs> and highlights to get a like, full repertoire. Like, oh, that guy sounds familiar. And you'd have to, you know, look him up. Montrez Harrell was a surprise in the fact that it was such a big name and a guy, as you mentioned, um, is such a good bench player. Uh, you, six man, former six man of the year. You mentioned Jordan Clarkson, also a six man of the year. These and a real six man. Sorry, Tyler Hero, an actual six man, not a starter <laughs> that they put on the bench. So, this is a guy that can contribute right away, and it was surprising, especially when you look at such a team friendly deal. Yes, I know it's a player option for the second year, but this is something that is going to give the Sixers two things. Two things, Danny, you and I know they need desperately, bench scoring and toughness. If I had a nickel for every time those players, whether it was Tobias Harris, Joel Embiid, or the front office or coaching staff after the heat loss in the, in the playoffs talked about grit, toughness, you know, we need that edge, and they started naming players. Montrez Harold should have been on, I mean, we all know P.J. Tucker was on Joel Embiid's lips, but Montrez Harold was right there, obviously, in the forefront. So this is a, a really big get for them. It's a really big component for what they need. He brings that depth on the bench. He brings a toughness. We know that. He certainly has been known to tussle uh, with a couple of guys out there. <laughs> so we're going to say that nicely. Maybe he's got, you know, he's got that toughness reputation. And I think that's half the battle. If you have that reputation, people are not going to come at you. So whether he's still that guy like he was five, six years ago, I don't know. But his reputation precedes him. So this was a huge gift for them. Yeah, interesting situation all told because a uh, friend of the podcast, Jason Dumas, uh, sports director of Cron out in San Francisco, shedding a little bit more light on the situation because according to his sources, uh, there was a bit of a toss-up for the Sixers between Markeith Morris and signing mm -hmm. uh, Montrez uh, to the team. And it turned out that Montrez ended up being the guy because – the Sixers wanted to wait out his legal process for that marijuana arrest that he had in Kentucky where uh, Marky Morris didn't want to wait that out. So he decided he wanted to sign with Brooklyn. The Sixers get Montrez. And I mean, I guess they would have been great either way. I mean, Montrez definitely addresses some specific concerns, as you mentioned, um, along with, um, you know, the toughness and the bench scoring it comes that familiarity I mentioned with Doc Rivers, with Daryl Morey as well, Daryl Morey okay. draft pick. Yeah, and James Harden. So they signed him for two years, just under six million bucks. Um, let's talk about that altercation. Him and Joel and B, man, they really got into it 
last season, uh, Noah Levick has an article on NBCSportsPhiladelphia.com about the Montrez acquisition, and it shows uh, a video and audio from the post-game sound when he got ejected with the Wizards and him and Joel getting into it a couple times. Um, did, I, I needed to be uh, reminded of that. I kind of forgot about that. What, did that come – was that front of mind for you, Amy? Yeah. I mean, the thing is – Joel and B is a long list of players that Montrez Harold has tried to fight or thought about fighting or actually fought uh, over the years, going back to his college days. So he definitely has that reputation. He is that guy, uh, that you know, bulldog type of mentality. Don't mess with me. He's a great guy to have on your team, maybe not so much if you're playing him. But yeah, the first thing I thought of was it was kind of like when Andre Drummond got here last year, you're like, didn't these two used to kind of like right, right, play? right. Not in the way, obviously, that Montrez Harrell and Joel Embiid did, but it would be like Kyle Lowry and Ben Simmons all of a sudden be on the same team. We all remember how they went at it. So it was the first thing I thought about. And I know there's a lot of that that's just not showmanship, but it's, you know, hey, listen, I'm just, I've got my guys back and I don't want to be pushed around, whatever, especially since he was with the Wizards, naturally going to get pushed around. So I don't know how much actual beef there was. I'm sure they're going to all downplay it like they did the drum and stuff, though I think there might have been a little bit there. I mean, at the, the beginning and then obviously when you become teammates it all goes away so i think that'll be the same case but absolutely i that's the first thing i thought of was like these two guys almost actually came to blows like a year ago so and there's a lot of players that have almost come to blows i feel like with montrez harrell so yeah it'll be it'll be interesting i'm sure when we see on media day coming up in a couple of weeks it'll be like oh no that was not a big deal and but i mean at the time it was I mean, he got ejected he was he looked like he was really hot under the collar Oh, man, when you listen to him talk about, you know, how he felt about the altercation, he definitely felt some type of way. Um, you mentioned Media Day. We are less than three weeks away, September 26th, before they head to South Carolina to the Citadel. But let's let's just peel back the layers here on this Montrez thing, Amy, because we will be doing the listeners, the viewers a disservice if we didn't fully reveal how things, um, how we all feel here about Montrez. Well, just really because, you know, you mentioned, Amy, that, you, you know, you, you thought they might be acquiring maybe a player or two where you might have to look up their stats a little bit or do a little research on what type of player they are and what they bring. But Montrez Harrell is a player that, you know, I know really well, and I know you know really well, specifically because he's a guy that you really follow from college all the way through the pros because of the impact he made and the run that his teams made in the NCAA tournament, and you're a huge college basketball fan. And as a Kentucky graduate that you are, him going to the rival school in the state of Kentucky, University of Louisville, also adds a little bit more to this. Oh, yeah. And I know we don't like to interject our personal feelings all the time, but um, I know you don't like the University of Louisville no. for obvious reasons. No, no, no. That's uh, that's pretty. I mean, that's it's. We hate the University of Louisville. <laughs> people that went there. I know some lovely people that went there. But yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, I've known Montrez Harrell, or at least been aware of his game going back to his days at Louisville. He was a heck of a player. He was the same kind of guy then. Uh, certainly, a very physical player. Wasn't scared of a hard foul, no matter what. And he had a lot of success. Uh, while suiting up for uh, Rick Patino, who I, I don't know where he coached. Uh, Iona, uh, is that still school? Um, but so it's it was, I definitely had like, the, my first thought was like, oh, <laughs> a Louisville player? I've avoided it so long. I've avoided it for so long. And there was, of course, there was the Donovan Mitchell thing. And I thought, oh, no. Right. But now, obviously, I don't really care that much about it. I used to give Tobias Harris a hard time because he went to Tennessee. But that, of course, then Tennessee beat Kentucky, and then he gave it right back. So that's uh, <laughs> I try not to let it uh, paint too uh, broad of a stroke over that. You know, I I cheer for Duke players now that they're for the Sixers, even though it it, it is strange. <laughs> but I hope Mont I think Montrez Harrell is a really good fit, despite the fact where he went to to school. I I don't hold that against him too much. Yeah, he's an interesting fit. I mean, obviously, Daryl Morey saw all that stuff that people saw in him as a collegiate player, even though he was a bit of a tweener and has definitely developed a three-point shot and things like that. He he drafted him when he was with the Houston Rockets. Uh, you mentioned how Morey – I mean, excuse me, uh, Harold and Harden played together in Houston as well. Um, and the, the relationships, you know, say what you want about Doc Rivers and 
some of his condescending tone and his idiosyncrasies and things like that, and maybe his coaching calls, but his relationships, Daryl Morey's relationships are really paying dividends mm-hmm. for the 76ers. Okay, the, the, all of a sudden there's a lot of former Houston players here and Harden and Daniel House and uh, you bring in Harrell as well and PJ Tucker, but these are quality players. I mean, players, yeah. a lot of teams were after, guys that could have signed elsewhere um and and been and been just fine but their relationships paying dividend and regardless of what you know th- those things that might annoy you about Maury about Rivers around the league they are so well respected and just bring in uh, attract guys here and and you got to love that as a Sixers fan oh absolutely i mean listen i know that the knock that i've seen on social media is that doc can't develop players and at this point in his career i don't do you really need to develop players? But then let's let's really kind of peel that back. Tyrese Maxey, he developed him. Are, are you not yeah. going to give Doc Rivers any credit for that? Yeah, right. maybe it's Sam Cassell, and certainly a lot of the credit goes to Tyrese Maxey himself. But look at the jump that he made. He was told by his coach, you need to improve these aspects of your game, your three-point shot, your late-game defense, uh, your late-game playmaking. Boom. Then he gets the opportunity, and we see what he's able to do. Andre Drummond, he gave him a flat. Andre Drummond was, had his foot out of the league. It was almost like a, people thought that was like a throwaway signing. And Doc Rivers comes, I'll never forget on media days, like this guy should be and can be a starter in the league. He gets traded to the Nets, and guess what? He showed with the Sixers that he could be, and then he is with the, the and, Nets. And Doc and Andre have some crazy relationship dating crazy back to like, like back when he was 14, 12 years old or something like yeah. that. So I don't know that that's, that's the knock like oh he has to sign all the guys he knows because he doesn't develop players i don't know that that's true because some of the evidence that i'm seeing is that he can develop he and his coaching staff obviously it's not all doc it's never all the coach it's never all one person it's a multitude of people and the player themselves so i think this is great because he has developed a certain rhythm and a certain chemistry with the core and they're finding pieces that fit with that that's something that danny you and i know the sixers have not maybe been so good at you're going back maybe 10 eight, 10, nine years, nine, 10, eight years. Why can't I say that in the row? Eight, (laughs) nine, 10 years. I said that all out of order. But you're thinking about, they just were like, oh, oh, we need a backup. Oh, let's get Al Horford. We'll plug him. That didn't work. We knew that wasn't Greg Monroe, right. Greg Greg Monroe. That was actually one of those. Like, no. Greg Monroe from Georgetown? Not really. But that was the thing. They just kind of went for the best player or a player that was available. And we'll just go with that guy because he's really good. I think the one thing that we need to look at, yes, their relationships they have, but they're also the fit they have with the Sixers team. That's the one thing I'm excited to see. It seems like on paper anyway, these all, all the guys, all the acquisitions are filling the necessary holes that they needed to fill. These are also guys at certain stages of their career, they're maybe ready to play more of a role or they already know that. PJ Tucker knows his role. Montrez Harold knows his role. Daniel House, all those guys know their role. That's important for a team that has superstars on it. You got to have those role players and you have to have that dog mentality guy too. So I I think that when people think about, oh, maybe it is they're just rebuilding the Rockets, that may be, but I think if they're rebuilding it smartly because they're showing that they can get guys that have the the needs that they need or have the uh, talents they need and then obviously can fit in with this team currently. I think that's the most important thing. Start college, build skills, and complete your degree with Wilmington University. 100% online options and affordable tuition makes WilmU work for you. Learn more at wilmu.edu. You talk about fit, Amy, and you talk about the names they're bringing in. Suddenly it is crowded, uh, yeah. really crowded when it comes to the Sixers roster. They bring in you know, four, maybe five guys, uh, Tucker, Harrell, uh, Daniel House. Um, they bring in the kid traveling queen from the yeah, G League. About the Anthony Melton. And the Anthony Melton, right. So they bring in five guys. W- w- what about the, the Cork Mazes, the J- Jaden Springers, the Shake Miltons, Matisse Thibbles? Where, where do they fit in? Paul Reed, Charles Bassey? Like, wh- where do these guys fit in? I, we thought Paul Reed had kind of developed some rapport or show shown improved with his you know high foul volume but but high contribution off the bench behind Joel Embiid as well so are these guys as trade bait are you feeling like something else is on the horizon 
Yeah. Uh, we know Utah is is having a fire sale. W what's your perspective on all that? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely guys that I think are just not going to be here, whether it's they're going to be traded or – George Niang? Yeah, I, I would think a guy like George Niang has a place on this bench for what he offers. Um, he knows his role. He yeah, needs to get better you talk about roles, role. absolutely, yeah. But he that's his. he's a three-point guy, and he knows it. He's like, listen, I'm not out there to shoot jumpers. They, that's what they had me for. He obviously tailed off towards the end of the year um, and certainly in the playoffs, which is something we saw – year before he got here to Philly. So it was a little concerning to me. But yeah, I mean, you mentioned like Paul, Paul Reed was a guy you're thinking, well, this guy seemed to have taken the next step. So there is that, there is that sentiment out there that this front office and this coaching staff is reluctant to play the young players. And, you know, from everything we've seen, that's yeah. the case. Is it because those guys are not ready or is it because they just want to stick with the veterans because they know what they give? that's something that we need to explore a little bit because I'm not really sure. I used to think it's because they're not ready. And then you see the players and you're thinking, well, they look, they look somewhat ready. I mean, I don't know about Jaden Springer. We barely saw him unless you watch any of the, the G league games. He looks right. good in some of those, but then you're thinking, all right, well, that's, you know, it's the blue coats. Is this really a good translation? Where would he fit on this roster right now? I think Furkan is the biggest one of, I don't know that he's going to be on this roster. I don't know what role he fills. Um, that's different from some of the guys you just named, obviously some of the five acquisitions or George Niang. Uh, certainly his playing time in the playoffs was sometimes non-existent. So I think that showed me a lot. It'll be interesting to see what happens with him. Um, and, and Charles Bassey, I mean, these are guys that can play in the league. Can they play for a team that is seeing themselves as a championship team? Probably not, but can they play in the league? Absolutely. So then do you need one more piece and, do you farm, like group them all together and say, all right, we've got this big group of pretty good players that can play, you know, for a team that's not competing for the championship. And can you give us something? I, I don't know that. Uh, obviously, I don't know what Daryl Moore's strategy is, but there are there are probably three too many guys right now on this roster as it sits that are not going to be on the team, whether it's because of trade or just being, you know, cut straight. Uh, I, I'll be interested. I would be very surprised if Furkan Korkmaz is here just because I would need to see what role they – see him as do they see him as that bench three-point guy great what's george niang do then is he that bench three-point guy right. okay now your bench is a little you, you only have a couple of spots down there so who else you got d anthony melton okay so he's the three and d guy montrez hair okay so now we're going down and down and down i think matisse seibel is, is not a starter i think pj tucker obviously slides into that starting role starting five um and i think matisse seibel is a player that they might try to move as far as a trade. He does have, obviously, a very high skill set when it comes to the defensive end, though I thought he got a little bit exposed in the playoffs against such high-level players. I mean, Jimmy Butler still dropped 40-something. Um, it seemed like every game he was ready to do that. So Siakam, too. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just he, he got exposed a little bit. He's still a very high-level defensive player. There is no doubt about that. He has an excellent skill set. His offensive game has never come up. I don't think it's going to come up. It is what it is. This is who he is. He can come out and get you a three every now and again, but he's going to stop, you know, so many of your your uh, good opponents, and he's going to come up with maybe two or three steals a game. So if that is a value to you, whatever team, then you know what do you have for us? But I, those those two guys, I don't think Furkan Korkmaz or Matisse Thibel at this time, you know, whatever. Let's we're saying at the All Star break, I can't imagine they're both in a Sixers uniform. Yeah, it's so interesting too um, when you think about what they can get for some of these guys. And you're you got a guy like Matisse Seibel who was a late round, late first round pick and turned into what he is, an all defensive caliber player who has this upside that you can see as far as a defender and possibly a three and D guy if his shot can come come around. But he would be a trade chip, maybe along with the draft pick, but you can see why so many of these you know, playoff caliber teams or championship contending teams end up shipping away so many of those draft picks because, yeah, one of them can turn into Tyrese Maxey or Matisse Thibel, but then you're, you, you're keeping the pick and drafting a guy like Jaden Springer, which doesn't – you don't even know if that's going to work mm -hmm. out and it doesn't seem like he's going to play a significant role in this team in the near future. Or it could be a Zaire Smith, which also didn't work out. So you can see why teams don't hang on to these – uh, draft picks and use them as trade bait to acquire more veteran type players. 
Uh, obviously, the uh, propensity for Doc Rivers and his uh, coaching staff not to play young players almost bit them in the butt with Tyrese Maxey because mm-hmm. he's one of one who can endure all the criticism and the tough love and the and the ribbing and whatnot and then come out the other side and be what he is and take these tremendous leaps forward to statistically and you know leadership wise and percentage wise and analytics wise and true shooting percentage and all those things but um i think that you know it it just really squeezes things and I, i like the competition it creates i like the idea that you know, all these guys might be in camp together and all competing for minutes and, you know, bringing the best out of each other. But uh, it's leaning heavily toward, you know, them being a veteran, you know, driven team. And even the veterans who are intermingled among those names we mentioned, like Shake Milton and Furkan Korkmaz, you know, like you said, what is their role ahead of guys that they just brought in? I think Daniel House or maybe Trevor and Queen might be the wink- weakest link among that group, but you're already like to the eighth, ninth, or tenth guy at that point. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. um, I-, I think you make some great points. It, but it-, it also blossoms into the idea, Amy, that are the Sixers, is this it? Is this the year where we- we've seen them finish with the best record? We've seen them finish fourth or fifth. Um, we've seen them, you know, be somewhere in between and still can't get over the hump into the Eastern Conference Finals or the NBA Finals, where do you think they stack up with all these acquisitions that's made? DeJounte Murray come from the Hawks. He's in the Eastern Conference. Mm-hmm. CJ McCollum's in the Eastern Conference. Donovan Mitchell with the Cavs. Look at, is in look the, at the Cavs. Conference. The Cavs are a completely different team right now. So, like, I mean, and on top of that, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving stayed in the Eastern Conference. So. Yeah. Well, first of all, you can throw the Nets out of there. That is the most dysfunctional <laughs> organization I have ever seen. I didn't even mention the Bucks. I didn't even That's mention the Bucks. Thing. The Bucks. The Bucks are the class. The Bucks are the class of the East. Yeah. They have the most sound, uh, I think, uh, roster. They have the most sound coaching. Uh, maybe the Heat are in that echelon as well. I mean, those those two are like, wow. This, this is this is who you're battling with. The Nets, I get it. I love Kevin Durant. I would have absolutely like mortgaged the farm to get that play because he is that special player. But that is a lot of dysfunction going on up there in Brooklyn. So right. that that'll rear its ugly head at some point or another. Whether they, maybe they can get it together and they just put everything aside, but that's that's a lot of bad blood and kind of inner turmoil, turmoil and kind of like feelings under the layers. But you mentioned it, and you didn't even mention like good young teams. Like let's talk about the Detroit Pistons for an example. Like, or the Bulls. The yeah. Bulls. Like these are some really good young teams that could challenge the Hawks obviously are are another one in there they seem to give this the Sixers fits so it's one of those things that you have to take baby steps and the Sixers I think have tried to take baby steps they've tried to build you know throughout the process let's build this team up oh we made the playoffs okay let's get to the next step let's win a first round series okay and then let's win a second one but we've been stuck at that let's win a first round series and a second round like they haven't gotten there. They can't win that second series in the playoffs. We've been stuck there for 20 plus years at this point. So I think they just threw caution to the wind. Like, we're not going to go from one, two, three. We're going to go one, two, 17. Like, we, we just got to go. So I don't, I don't know that they're going to challenge this year for the NBA finals. But if they don't make it to the Eastern Conference finals, last year I thought that if they didn't make it to the Eastern Conference finals, Doc Rivers would get fired. I thought for sure that was going to happen. They didn't. It was a letdown. But then there was the built-in of like, okay, well, James Harden only had 21 games in the regular season. That was a big piece to try to fit in. He obviously wasn't playing without Ben Simmons. Simmons. Yeah, the whole Ben The fact that he got them through that Ben Simmons thing probably earned him, in my opinion, another year because that was in the whole thing when you think about it. When that whatever special comes out, which I hope we do here in NBC Sports <laughs> Philadelphia, it's good. You You wouldn't believe it. It's insane to think about when he shows up. Does he have a phone in his pocket? What the whole thing is bananas. The whole thing is bananas. He doesn't even like basketball. We have no idea. Is he ever coming again? We have no idea. So the fact that that Doc kind of guided them through and guided the team through that, and then they finished where they did, I thought was actually an important part of probably his evaluation with the front office. Uh, I would think that, that they would look at that and be like, "Listen, there was only one coach that could kind of look the same way." almost in the same vein that Brett Brown guided them through a lot of the stuff. He probably bought himself a couple of extra years because 
he was just a guy to get them through the process. And then he started winning and I'm thinking, oh, well, maybe, maybe this could work. And then obviously in the end, it wasn't going to work. So I think that, but it has to be Eastern Conference Finals at the bare minimum. Uh, I would think an NBA Finals trip when you built this team the way it is currently structured, the way that you got James Harden to take less money to bring in more players, you brought in all the players that you want. There is probably a mindset you need to give them more than a year to, to get there. But at the same time, some of these guys that you brought in are up there in age. These guys are in their mid-30s now, not early 30s. So how much time do you give them? So I just think that, yes, they can compete with some of the teams you named. Yeah, they can compete with, uh, obviously, some of the skilled players that you see out there. Charlotte is a very skilled team. Very young, but very skilled. Yeah. The Nets, I think they can compete with the Nets. I don't really worry about the Nets. The Celtics, not too concerned with them, though I know that they're very good and they were just in the finals and whatever. We didn't even mention the Celtics. Think about it. It's just Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown and everybody. But I think they can compete with them. The teams I would worry about are the teams that are so well coached and so well constructed and that have been playing together now for several years in their current form. Maybe they added a little piece here and there, but they had the same team. Those are the teams you do want to worry about, the Bucks and the Heat. I would think those are the, the main contenders. You could throw the Celtics in there too with just, just with Jason Tatum alone. I think he learned so much in the finals. He's only going to get better. He is very young and they're going to be together for a long time. Now they obviously have tried to trade off a couple of pieces to try to get more talent because they think they need another star. Um, but I think their coaching staff could probably probably win with what they certainly have right now. We saw that last year. I didn't think they were going to win the finals, but I think they did learn a lot. I think a lot of teams do that. You see what happened to the Bucs, as close as they got, and then the next year they got over the hunk. Oh, we need one more thing. Drew Holiday comes in, and next thing you know. So I, I would the Cavaliers, I think they can compete with them, though I, obviously those are very high scale high-powered, very high-scoring teams on paper with the Cavaliers. But I do worry about a Heat team. I do worry about a Bucks team just because of star power, the scoring, the depth, and the coaching because those those teams really have it all between the, the Bucks, the Celtics, and, and the Heat. And the idea of them trying to take that next step forward, uh, we talked about this uh, on the a previous podcast. I, it's but, not even but, I don't think they can even see the Eastern Conference Finals right now. Are you the type of person who thinks like stuff like going to the Citadel for training camp is like, you know, team bonding? Is, is that something you think makes a difference? Or do you, and also, do you think that it even matters for them what seed they get if they're trying to make that push to the Eastern yeah. Conference Finals? Like if they're a four seed, will that matter? One seed or whatever? What do you think? I don't think the seeding matters. I, I think that that's one thing we've learned in the last couple of years. Obviously, the one seed is great for a myriad of reasons, but the Sixers actually positioned themselves pretty well, I thought, towards the end of the year that they avoided who everybody thought you should avoid, which was the Nets, and then you didn't have to deal with the Nets or the Celtics or any of that mess. And then you, you got the best draw that you could have, all things considered, as far as who you're playing. So I think that you, your draw is your draw. You can control it to a certain degree, but once the playoffs happen, I feel like teams are all at a different level. They all kind of take it up a notch. But to your first point, going away, now this is something you see a lot. You see it a lot with college teams because there is so much newness. They go away, they take the trip, and they go play the tournament in the Bahamas, or they go overseas to play a tournament, or they go up in, and play it in, in Las Vegas or California. Or Alaska, or, or yeah. Or like the Great Alaska Shootout, or, or you know, Maui. The, the, there you go. Matt, why didn't we ever get to go to any of those things? <laughs> I never went to Maui or even Alaska. But you see that. You see it in football. You know, training camps used to all be away because we're new guys. Let's come together. So I think there is some merit to that. I think there is a little bit of, you know, kind of some science behind it, aside from the fact that I know that they want to do a lot of different stuff. Doc wants to, you know, he is big on showing these guys outside of basketball some important things. Charleston, South Carolina has a lot of things that will be of interest for anybody. I, I urge anybody to go there. It's a beautiful town, but it has a lot of stuff to see and, and, and to look at and to learn about, about our country's history. So I think that that's important. It's important to Doc, and therefore it's important to his team. I think being away is very good, outside distractions, especially with a team that has so many veterans. These guys have been through the wars. They know what it takes to get to the playoffs. All the guys they brought in pretty much have been in the playoffs and have had success. So, and this team has it. They haven't had that success in the playoffs. So bringing those guys in and being able to kind of, you know, talk about things at nighttime, no distractions. You know, 
remember last year, Joel Embiid talked about how different this team was. He'd never been out to dinner with everybody. They were starting to do that. Right. This team needs to start doing that. And Embiid has learned his role as a leader. Now this is the next step in that process. Sorry to, for the pun, but it really is. For him to be the, the leader of this team, he showed last year he could be that guy. Now let's take it to the next step. You have a lot of new guys coming in. They're going to be contributors right away. You need to bring them in the fold fast. And I think this is a good way to do it. Amy, a couple of days ago, we were all humbling, minding our business, and then Twitter erupts with this video of Furkan Korkmaz going nose to nose in the Eurobasket yeah, 2022, head to head, nose to nose, and it a lot. You know, it's always funny. I think about those situations like Furkan and the Georgian player don't speak the same language. So are they arguing in English? Like what, like what, how are they like getting into each other's head? How are they, you know, insulting each other I in that some moment? Insults, no matter what the translation is, just, just, you are, just, just carry your over. You, it, the, so, the tone and the manner in which they're said, you don't really need to know exactly what was said. You, you know what was said. I'm sure it wasn't good. And maybe he knows enough of whatever it was just to be like, let's not, uh, don't call me that. But I believe some of the, the insults, were hurled in English just to really make sure. <laughs> Had to be, right, home. right. Now, from what I read, there was a couple that were definitely, I read them, and I assumed that, that that meant that they were in English, maybe not a translation, unless the person writing the article was fluent in, in Georgian or, or or Turkish or whatever was, was being spoken at that point. But uh, yes, so it was interesting. The whole thing is bananas. Because last two off seasons ago, we had great videos of Furkan like dunking with fire basketballs. Now this one <laughs> is a little different for the off season video from Furkan. And it was one of those fights where they separated them and they came back together, and then other players got then involved. They went and got and him. Then they went and found him again after getting ejected. They found him well, in the locker room. It was toothy on the court, and then off the court, it got it escalated even more. It got, it got like actually like to the point of like an international incident. Where they're calling for the, the the Turkish coach was calling for what the vi- we need to see all the video right now we need to see who oh, was man. there the they police was involved FIBA, and I was like this is bananas holy smokes let's let's see the video let's put it on Twitter <laughs> and all people like Furkan Korkmaz yeah. who yeah. is pretty mild mannered he's a pretty mild mannered dude very mild mannered so maybe he maybe he saw that the Sixers you know after saying that oh we we need a toughness he's like I got right it. right. I got it right here. I'm with you. I thought he missed his moment. I thought he missed his moment afterward. He only tweeted out like three Turkish flags. I thought if he had come out and said something like, Rocky ain't got nothing on me or something that people could latch on to. Give me something. Give me a little something that that alludes more to like you wanted to fight the guy and then everybody wants you to fight him. So we got you back. But listen, he, he played it diplomatically. I appreciate that. He probably didn't want to get suspended from FIBA. Came out, Came out cooking out. the next game, though. I, I think he was like 6-12, and 12, had like 16 points. Listen, Danny, how many years are we going to talk about off-season videos of people shooting well? Like, I just I can't. <laughs> we lived through it with Ben Simmons. Burkhan obviously can make a three, but I, I'm all good with any off-season. Also, can we talk about, just side note, how many players play in these, like, Pro style pickup games, and how nervous would that make you? Everybody, oh, we're in the rough classic, oh, we're in the crossover, oh, we're at the Drew League. That, that would give, as a front office, that would give me a heart attack. A heart yeah, attack. definitely. You got to think that. Uh, million dollars, and he rolls up at the rough classic. I'd have been like, no, mm-mm, no, no. You need to be in a bubble wrap. We need you to show up. Right, absolutely. Because you probably, not probably, you can't really hold players back for playing for their country so like right. Eurobasket, greece turkey right. you know Giannis with his country no, idea, you know i get it right and the olympics and things like that but yeah like with what happened with chet holmgren at the drew league you know that these teams are going to be like think, putting clauses in for these top draft picks. like that was you could have written that five months ago come on it was too predictable yeah. it was it was i was i was so felt so bad, was so devastated for him because obviously he has a huge ceiling. He's a tremendous player, but it was just like he broke his foot. He not just broke his foot. The Liz Frank, everyone in Philadelphia knows exactly what the Liz Frank fracture is. We've had doctors on talking about it. We've talked to people that have had it. Mark Jackson talked about when we, he had it. But I was like, that is not good. That is not a good injury for a big man. That's a year plus. Uh, and and plus, and on top of that, I feel like like uh, Tyrese Maxey, when he talked after the Rump Classic, he talked about just going out there to have fun and yeah. that 
he wasn't going full speed. But if you put Chet Holmgren, are- say it again. The other guys are going full speed. Well, well, they're going full speed, but as an NBA player, your full speed has got to be better yeah. than than their full yeah. oh, speed. Yeah. But but if you put Chet Holmgren on the court with LeBron James and on a like, how can you? You know what I mean? It's like you, I mean, welcome to the league. He would have been going against LeBron James at some point or Carl. Anthony well, Ch- but so in that mean. instance, you know, Chet is like he's trying to prove something. He's trying to oh, show yeah. he's you know what I mean. So I don't know. It, like if you're yeah, with your was, teammates, you don't, you don't just, probably have as much on the line for him. I still think you know uh, Jabari Young or, or pa- Paolo Bancaro are probably my front runners for rookie of the year. But if I Chet Holmgren can get win it next year, just like Ben Simmons did, you never know. Right, or or Blake Griffin or whoever else. Right. Oh yeah. Um, sure. um, big game, Amy, as I like to call her. Thank you for chiming in with us here and lending your expertise. Uh, you can catch her on all social media platforms at Amy Padul MBCS. Is that yes, what it is? That's correct. Okay, there it is. Um, like follow you know, her, yes. uh, like, comment, um, and tell her how handsome her children are, um, as I do. So, okay. um, Amy, thank you for joining us. Uh, much love and respect as always. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. This has been the Sixers Talk podcast brought to you by Wilmington University. For Amy and Ben Barry, I'm Danny Pommels. We'll see you next time.